Hello. This is another in the Why Study series, produced by the Department of Theology and Religious Studies here in Nottingham. And with me today is Dr. Mary Cunningham, who has written extensively on Mary, the Mother of God. And today she's going to try and answer the question, why study Mary, the Mother of God? Mary, over to you. Well, this is a very important figure in Christian tradition. Um, she is, of course, the mother of Jesus Christ. And some of the Gospels, especially Luke and John, devote quite a, a considerable amount of time to exploring who this figure is. On the other hand, um, people have commented that um, although Luke devotes his first two chapters to the nativity of Jesus and focuses a great deal on Mary's role in that and on her, even on her feelings and her response, very little attention is paid to her later on. Um, and also in the other Gospels, she's rarely mentioned except occasionally. So some Christians have wondered whether she is an important figure or not in this narrative. But what appears to be the case is that as the centuries passed, Christians began to reflect more and more on Mary's role in the Incarnation, to see this as essential to the story of how God became man, and to focus on various aspects of that story. One is the question, how could a human being, a woman, a young girl in fact, give birth to this man who was the Son of God, to uh, the Messiah? Was there something very special about her? Was she singled out by God from the very beginning? Um, how did he choose this particular woman? And how was she prepared for that role? So from about the second century onward, we begin to see Christians writing about Mary. Um, one of the most important texts from that period is um, an apocryphal gospel called the Protevangelium of James, in which the narrative about Mary's own conception and birth, her childhood, how she came to be betrothed to Joseph, is told for the first time. Now, this gospel was not accepted into the canon of the New Testament, but it did enter the tradition in that patristic writers, preachers, hymnographers began to use it and to accept this story and to see it as genuine. Um, they probably believed it had been passed down orally and then finally written down in the middle of the second century or so. And of course, even though very few people will have heard of the Protevangelium, many uh, many people in the West will know, they will know that the, the, the mother of Mary is supposed to be Anna mm -hmm. and the father Joachim. Yes. And of course, this is, this is a story that is from, from that text. Yes. And they also tend to know um, so many of the, um, so many of the, the artists, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the famous picture by Raphael, they, mm -hmm. they showed the, the, the nativity taking place in a cave. Yes. And of course, that's another image Yes. Uh, that, 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 that comes from that text. So even though the text has disappeared and is only known, to, it's really mm -hmm. only known now in, in academic circles, many of its stories, uh, and of course, I know many Roman Catholic nuns mm. who belong to the presentation order, Yes. And that, of course, is the story of Mary yes. being presented in the temple. That raises an interesting question. Uh, this, uh, Mary, the mother of God, there's devotion in the East and there's devotion in the West. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on the differences between the two approaches? Well, I think the differences have developed very slowly over time, up until about the 11th century. It's, one doesn't see very much difference between East and West. Um, feasts which were based on the story of the Protevangelium about Mary's con um, conception and birth, these were celebrated on certain days in the church. 
The feasts were instituted generally first in the East and then introduced in the West slightly later. But if one does begin to see a difference, in the West, the focus becomes increasingly on Mary as a figure of dignity in her own right, on her role as intercessor, someone to whom Christians pray and who they hope will help them. She's not seen as having divine power in her own right, but she is a preeminent intercessor before Christ, her son. Um, as this happened, they began to emphasize more and more her purity, her immaculate nature. And this developed into controversies in the later Middle Ages about the extent to which one can call Mary, the Virgin Mary, someone who is completely free of original sin. And there was not agreement on this issue. It was finally only decided in 1854 in a bull published by the Pope that she had an, her conception was immaculate. This is stating that from the very moment of her conception, she was absolved of the original sin, that tendency to sinfulness that all other human beings have, and in that way is completely set apart from the rest of humanity. But the Eastern Church, on the other hand, did not accept that bull and has never gone so far as to systematize any teaching on Mary's purity. On the other hand, the liturgical texts in the East do emphasize very much her goodness, her purity. Uh, they would never suggest that she did sin, although some of the earlier texts do suggest that like any other human being, she tried to grow better, she tried to um, pray, fast, become a better human being, um, that she was, in other words, a human being like any other. And I think the emphasis on Mary's humanity in the East has always been maintained much more than in the West. You've been talking to us about the difference between the orthodox approach and what's essentially the Roman Catholic approach. Mm -hmm. But of course, within the West, there's a further division. Mm. And within that division, Mary is again one of the fault lines. Mm. And that is between the Roman Catholic Church and the Churches of the Reformation. Would you like to yes. talk about that? I think it's easy to oversimplify this issue because some of the earliest reformers, like Martin Luther, in fact, remained devoted to the Mother of God. Um, he, he writes in very sympathetic terms and seems to have had profound devotion to her. What the reformers did question, though, and I think this became increasingly strident in some circles, was that they disliked um, excessive devotion in the sense of a cult to the Mother of God, which they thought would distract Christians from praying directly to God himself, to Christ. And they saw her as becoming an extra intermediary who is not needed in Christians' relationships with, relationship with Christ. So along with the other saints and with holy images, they wanted to eradicate excessive devotion but even uh, many, I think, Anglican reformers, for example, retained a strong sense of the theological importance of Mary and the importance of her role in the Incarnation. They just didn't think that she should be exalted as a figure to whom prayer should be addressed as someone of dignity in her own right in the same way as it was being done in the Catholic Church. There's a renewal of interest today in Mary in theological circles, mm -hmm. often sometimes driven by ecumenical concerns, but sometimes driven by feminist concerns. Could you just say one or two words on, on, on this renewal of interest that has taken place in the theology of Mary? Yes, I think this reflects um, an interest in her femininity, in the need for a female figure within the church hierarchy. 
And feminists have reacted in different ways to this. Some have seen her as a figure of power who, uh, in the Catholic Church, for example, is a very welcome addition to what is seen as an all-male trinity, and that she should be a figure of importance um, is very much emphasized by some feminists. Other thinkers, on the other hand, see her as a creation of a patriarchal church and see her as representing qualities such as submission, virginity, um, simply fulfilling a role uh, which they see as not being a good model for women who want to take their lives into their own hands and be seen as responsible um, human beings in their own right. So I think the feminist response to Mary is somewhat equivocal, but many modern Christians do find her a welcome female model uh, for them to emulate, for them to pray to and relate to within the church, which I think arguably does have a rather male aspect at times. And of course, there is always the practical issue in that if you look at how theologians react to Mary, you can often, it often touch, it, it often becomes sort of a keyhole to a whole other area, to, 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 to vast other areas of, of theology, but you can mm. compare theologians. Yes, that's true. There have been such a wealth of reactions to Mary, that makes this a field worthy of study in its, for its own uh, reasons. But I would argue that um, as um, a figure who occupies a very important place in Christian theology for her role in the Incarnation, she is an essential part of Christian theology, which we should study. Mary, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us today. You're very welcome. Thank you.